Hello, today we're going to be talking about shade matching a dark central incisor, a brutal case. These are absolutely brutal. You'd rather do 10 veneers than one or two. So what do you do if you've got the single dark central? How do you restore that case aesthetically? Here's a before and after. You can see we've got a dark right central incisor. This tooth had been damaged early in her life and it had endodontic treatment and as often happens uh, the tooth darkens again before and after. See the dark central. Size alleged position was lips in repose before and after. And the shades of the adjacent teeth affects of course the final result too. So in this case we're going to bleach the adjacent teeth and get them uh, a little bit lighter before we do the final restoration. Now my feeling is I never do, I never veneer just one central incisor. If I'm doing restoring one central incisor, whatever I do to this central, I'm going to also do to the adjacent central. So both of these teeth have porcelain veneers. Again, just before and after. So we begin with a painless and profound local anesthetic. Now this is so critical. If you want your patients to love you, learn how to give totally painless and profound local anesthetic. And you can link to my YouTube video on how to give a painless injection. You must be able to do this. People won't dread coming to see you. Okay, so the length of the original central incisors is 11 millimeters, whereas well, you know from my YouTube video on aesthetics, the average length of a maxillary central incisor is 11 millimeters. So this is a pretty, this is a good length. The longest normal central incisor, unless there's gingival recession or the person is a giant, is 12 millimeters. So I try to keep uh, the porcelain veneer length or the restored length of the tooth to 12 millimeters or under, unless there's something unusual like uh, recessed gingiva creating an abnormally long situation. So the other central also is 10 and plus. Then the other aesthetic concept that you'll remember is you want to have some tooth display with lips in repose. And we do have some central incisor tooth display with lips in repose. The other concepts are I want the central incisors to be the longest teeth so when I restore these two centrals, I'm probably going to make the centrals just a little bit longer. That's a very youthful and aesthetic look if the central incisors are a little bit longer. It's also a very youthful look. And I want a line drawn from the cusp tip of the cuspid to the cusp tip of the other cuspid to form a U and be parallel to the lower lip. And I want the incisal plane of the central incisors to be parallel to a line drawn between the pupils. So the first thing I'm going to do is cut between the central incisors and between the central incisors and the lateral incisor. I'm also going to prep the incisal edge. This is called wrapping. It was a term coined by Pascal Monnier and Douglas in their, in their article about creating the very finest porcelain veneers. I'm going to cut straight through and when you make this cut, be sure the patient is sitting up in the operatory chair so you cut through perpendicular to a line drawn between the pupils. You want that cut to be perpendicular to that line. Now the midline is of, of very little consequence. I don't care if the midline is in the middle of the face or not. Ideally it would be, but it's very difficult to change a midline from here to here. And the midline can be off up to four millimeters and the average person won't notice that. So I'm not trying to change the midline. I just want the cut between the central incisors to be perpendicular to a line drawn between the pupils, which represents the floor or a flat plane. So sit the patient up in the chair when you make this cut and just cut straight through. This is a thin diamond and I'm cutting between 
the central and the lateral. Very thin shofu diamond and just cut straight through also. But you don't have to have the patient sitting up in the chair to make these cuts, just the one between the central incisors. You don't, you don't want to touch the adjacent teeth. Now I'm cutting my depth cuts with a coarse barrel diamond and I want the depth cuts to be about a half a millimeter into the tooth except for the part in the gingival one-fourth. I just want that to barely remove any tooth structure because the enamel is very thin down here. Now the exception is if it's a dark tooth. In the case of the dark right central incisor, I'm going to be a little more aggressive in my preparation. Rather than a half millimeter of tooth structure redu reduction, I'm going to reduce this tooth about a millimeter and the prep at the gingival line is going to be more of a deep chamfer than a flame shape because of the darkness I want more room for the porcelain uh, material so we can block out that dark. Now sometimes I'll internally bleach these teeth prior to prepping the tooth. Th this tooth had had endodontics it was very it was a very sclerotic pulp chamber and it was filled with composite, so it would be very difficult to bleach that tooth internally. So I'm going to be a little more aggressive, and I'm going to prep the facial surface of this tooth about a millimeter. Only about a half a millimeter, though, for the left central. And this is more, because it's so yellow and dark down here, this is almost a shoulder preparation. It's just a deep chamfer on the right central but that's not necessary on the left central. You can see I'm using, normally I use a flame-shaped diamond for the margins of veneer preparations. In this case, on the right dark central, I'm using a small chamfer diamond to have just a little more depth. And I'm going about a millimeter subgingival, but only about a half a millimeter subgingival interproximally. So a millimeter into the sulcus on the facial but about a half millimeter into the sulcus interproximally. The reason for that is these fibers are very, these periodontal fibers are very dense interproximally. You want to be sure you don't invade the biologic width. So only a half millimeter interproximally, but you can go into the sulcus a millimeter on the facial. Then I'm using an occlusal reduction flat burr to create a flat surface on the incisal edge. I want this to be flat. Don't taco it. Don't round it onto or chamfer it onto the palatal surface. Make it totally flat and then you're going to round off the incisal facial and the incisal mesial and distal line angles. But keep that line angle, the incisal pal palatal line angle will be 90 degrees very important. So when I'm doing the incisal preparation again I want to sit the patient up in the chair with retractors and make that incisal preparation parallel to the pupillary line. Don't have the patient laid back in the chair or you won't get that line angle straight. Then I'm going to round off the incisal facial and the incisal distal and the incisal mesial line angles, so these are round. But the incisal palatal line angle is a right angle. See, I've been a little more aggressive on the dark tooth on the facial to make more room for porcelain to block out the dark. The preparation is still in enamel, however. So let's review the line angles. The facial, mesial, and the facial distal line angles are rounded. The incisal facial line angle is rounded. The incisal mesial and distal line angles are rounded. Remember this. Take a deep breath and pay attention. The incisal palatal line angle is 90 degrees. This is not rounded. So I'm placing retraction cord. This is 0, 0, Z twist by Gingy cord, non-impregnated. There's no uh, hemostatic agent in the cord. You can link to my YouTube video on how to place retraction cord. Now we're talking about two central incisors here. If you want to know about how to prep a major 
veneer case, a comprehensive case, upper and lower veneers, 10 veneers on the top, 10 veneers on the bottom, full mouth reconstructions, increasing vertical dimension. Go to dentistrymasterclasses.com. Those are the comprehensive cases. So I'm placing this cord only on the facial, not the interproximal. You don't want to strangulate that pupilla. If you place this cord interproximally and this cord interproximally, and you squeeze that pupilla, you could lose the pupilla, so don't do that. Just place this lightly into the sulcus on the facial. Then if you're using a polyether impression, you need to block out the interproximal spaces between the other teeth. So this is just Luxabite by Luxatemp, and it blocks out the undercut. You can see how dark that tooth is. So I'm checking my preps to be sure this incisal edge of the, of the prepared central incisors is parallel to the pupillary line. Now why the pupillary line? The pupillary line, when the patient is sitting erect, represents the floor or the earth or a flat plane. So you can see the incisal edge preparation is parallel to the pupillary line. Okay, this is a polyether with custom tray, and remember it's critical that you use a custom tray when you're taking a polyether or polyvinyl siloxane impression. If you don't use a custom tray, there's too much volume of unset material and you'll get slumping of the material, which will cause blibs and voids and other things in the poured stone model. So you must use a custom tray. The other reason is this custom tray forces that impression, the unset material, into the sulcus and captures those margins beautifully. So this is the deadliest impression material. So see, I've got my custom tray. You can go to the link on how to take the most accurate impression. And then I'm flowing the unset body material into the custom tray. See, I keep the tip in the material so you don't incorporate voids or air bubbles. Now I'm squirting the wash material directly onto the unset body polyether material. Don't squirt it on the teeth or you might incorporate an air bubble. Just squirt it onto the unset body material in the custom tray, just like this. So wet the material. One of the things I love about polyether and reversible hydrocolloid is they are hydrophilic. They love water. So rinse the teeth well before you place the material. You can just leave the water on the teeth. Whereas polyvinyl siloxane is hydrophobic, it does not like water. So see, this is still wet, and this polyether will displace the water and go into the sulcus and capture those margins beautifully. Look how crisp those margins are. Then most of you don't even know what reversible hydrocolloid is. It's a very inexpensive but deadly accurate impression material. It involves water baths and custom trays that are vented and water runs through the trays. And so I always take two impressions. In a case like this, I'm taking a polyether and I'm chasing it with a reversible hydrocolloid impression. They're very, very, very accurate. See how crisp and clean those impressions are? Then I'm going to take a face bow. You must take a face bow. You can refer to this link in the Dentistry Masterclasses library on how to take a face bow. It's imperative you take a face bow anytime you're doing anterior teeth because the face bow orients the case on the articulator the same way it's oriented in the mouth. If you don't take a face bow, your technician is guessing. So you are not a good dentist, period, if you don't use face bows. You have to send a face bow with an anterior case. Otherwise, you're handcuffing your technician. So this is the wax up. You can refer to the link on wax up and why you wax it up. And that wax up makes the, the, the uh, stone model just about a millimeter thicker than the normal tooth. So whenever you fabricate your provisional, you've got a thickness of material to work with. If you try to make the, the, the matrix off of the preoperative stone model, when you reduce the tooth just half a millimeter, there's not enough polyvinyl, uh, not enough uh, bisacrylate to work with. And it's kind of like working with wet tissue paper. So you wax it up a millimeter thicker 
and then you've got a, a thickness of bisacrylate to work with. So here's the ma matrix, which is made from the waxed up model. Mark your midline. Then you're going to squirt the bisacrylate into the matrix. Now be sure you keep the tip of the bisacrylate at the bottom of the matrix and rub it to break the surface tension so you don't get air bubbles or voids in the bisacrylate material. Keep the tip in the, in the material. Don't take it out of the material like this. Then you're going to wet the teeth, soppy wet. I want them as wet as you can get them. And then you're going to squirt this bisacrylate on the teeth. Keep the tip in the material so you don't incorporate voids and air bubbles. Put it to place. It's a very accurate provisional technique. You can refer to the link on how to fabricate provisional veneers. This is just a two-sided diamond disc. Always begin with that. Then this is just a, a thin acrylic burr. And I want to be sure to cut this up in the interproximal area to make room for the papilla so you don't strangulate the papilla with your provisionals. And this doesn't take any time to fabricate these, probably 10 minutes. Nice fit. Now we're, we're taking a stump shade for the laboratory technician. And this is B1, B2, B3, B4. And I'm going to send this with the technician so he can see, he or she can see the gradation of shades and how that matches the prep teeth. I'm going to send this photograph with the case. So you can see this stump shade is about a B3 of this one, and this stump shade is about an A2. So I'm going to put just a dot of etch in the center of each prepared tooth for the provisionals, just a dot. Then once that's set for about 15, 20 seconds, suck it straight off with your aspirator so it doesn't get all over the tooth. And then once you've sucked it straight off, rinse it well, real well with your air water syringe. Okay, then rinse that real well. Then I'm going to squirt. Notice this is only adhesive. It's not primer adhesive. Only adhesive. This is Scotch Bond by 3M into the tooth side of the provisionals. And I'm going to push that to place, kind of wipe it on the outer part of the provisional, and it, it serves as a glaze. Then I'm going to put a two by two behind the provisionals in the mouth, and I'm going to blow off the excess adhesive onto the two by two. Then once I've blown it all off and I hold it with my fingers while I'm blowing it off, I'm going to cure each veneer 20 seconds on each side. And then I'm going to send this photograph. I also sent a photograph of the prep teeth with the lips retracted and the, the eyes in the picture to the laboratory technician so he can confirm, he or she can confirm the face bone mounting. I'm going to send an impression, a full arch impression with the provisionals in place to the technician along with this photograph so that the technician can see that the incisal plane of the provisionals is parallel to the pupillary line and he can use that as a guide when he's fabricating the final rest restorations. I'm going to send this photograph to the technician too. It's lips in repose so he can see that there is tooth display with lips in repose. The other thing that he'll be able to see is that the centrals are the longest teeth. Remember in the incisal plane alignment you always want the centrals to be the longest teeth and you want some central incisor tooth display with the lips in repose. Very simple, quick, easy provisional restoration technique. This is to be continued on part two now. And that's the dental minute. These techniques work and they work every time.